Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are in the country and maybe even around the world. It's Simon Mannering here, the CEO and founder of WeFirst, and welcome to this month's webinar. I'm really excited to share the topics um, and the insights in and around how you show up as a speaker, the difference it can make to building your business and scaling your impact. But most importantly, I want to say I hope everyone is safe and well in these very, very challenging times. And let's all wear a mask, let's stay inside, and let's stay safe, especially during this winter. Now, with all that said, this webinar is all about you building your business most effectively. And so this is a webinar we do for you, you know, to really add value to your business. So to that end, make sure if you have questions, go down to the dialogue box at the bottom there, and you actually just click on the Q&A button and you can enter your questions and then we'll be able to answer the questions at the end of the material that I'm going to present. So again, it's about you. So when it comes to speaking, to pitching, to presenting, in, so that you can build your business, make sure you enter the questions. So let's dive in. Today's topic is squarely focused on how to become a world-class speaker to help you build your purposeful brand. And I think, you know, in a vacuum, all of us want to be better at what we do. We want to show up in ways that are going to resonate more deeply with people, whether we're talking to six people in a meeting or thousands of people in an auditorium. And the reason I wanted to share this topic today is I've been lucky enough over the last 10 years to do a lot of speaking on stages around the world. And, you know, this wasn't always the case. Back in 2010, I was an ad guy, just a freelancer. I'd been doing, you know, presentations and pitches um, in advertising agencies, but that was it. But then I wrote a book that came out in 2011 called We First. And, you know, it was a New York Times bestseller and it was voted best marketing book of the year. And that catapulted it to a level of success where suddenly I found myself I had to become a speaker. And I'd never had any intentions of being a speaker. I didn't know how to do it. I'd never really done a public speech. And so there I was suddenly having to scramble to learn, you know, on the fly. And yet, you know, I got very intentional about it. And within, you know, three years, I was on the cover of the National Speakers Magazine. And then this year in 2020, I was voted one of the top 50 keynote speakers in the world by real leaders. And that's not a boast. I'm sharing that as context for, you know, the insights I'm going to share with you today, because I was very, very intentional about how to get better at that aspect of what I do, because I simply had no idea. And like anything, it's a skill. It's a craft. It's something you can develop. And that in turn will unlock enormous value to you, to your business and to your impact. And, you know, I came away from all of this experience over the last nine or 10 years, realizing that how you show up in a room, in an auditorium, really determines what shows up in your life. You know, how much alignment is there between who you are and what you do? How deeply does your message resonate with people? And how does that resonance allow you, you know, to win the day? Because here's the thing, speaking communicating, sharing your story, pitching your idea is absolutely critical and on so many fronts, including how you open the door to a new opportunity or how you compete when you're up against four, five, six, ten competitors for a piece of business or to get funding or whatever it might be. And also how you win the day, how you close the deal, because ultimately 70% of communication is physical and People really make decisions based on how you connect on an emotional level. So how are you going to communicate what you do, what you care about, what value you can bring to the table in a way that's going to give you the best shot at success? And, you know, this it also allows you to address several challenges that we all face as communicators. Like in, I think in acting parlance, they talk about sometimes you go up, you forget your lines and, you know, it's because you're rushing and you're thinking about what you're saying but you're not really on the other person. So how do you avoid that? And how do you make sure that you don't always default to what you want to say rather than what you know the client needs to hear or wants to hear for it or in order for you to get the deal done? And so all of these insights I'm going to give you today are to make sure that you capture these opportunities and that you can navigate around these very human and very common challenges. And, you know, I've only ever shared this content for the first time this week ever. It's something I've been gathering on the way through. And so I'm really excited to share it with you because, yes, I've always been doing webinars about 
purposeful business and how you can unlock growth and impact for that business. But one of the tools, one of the levers you get to pull is how you show up, how you communicate. And it's been quite a journey to get here. I mean, I'll tell you why I'm so passionate about this is because when I was going to launch the book in 2011, about six or eight weeks before, um, someone kindly reached out to me and said, would you be interested in doing a TEDx talk? And at that time, there'd been the TED talks themselves, but there'd only been two or three TEDx talks ever. I mean, they're very popular today, but this was a new thing. And they invited me to speak and I didn't have any real marketing plan for the book. And so I thought, great, I can get up on stage and talk about it and maybe that will help. And it turned out that it was actually at the Yerba Center, which is that big center up in San Francisco, where Steve Jobs did all of his announcements of the iPhone. And so suddenly I was terrified. My first public speech is on this last large stage with 1,500 people from Google and all the tech companies and so on. So I felt very, very intimidated and extremely nervous. And so I get there and, you know, I do my preparation. I try and make sure that I've, I've got something substantive and meaningful to say. And I'm all kind of mic'd up. I've got the headset on and I'm, I'm about to go out and speak. And I'm standing in the wings at the Yerba Center, really, really nervous. And I'm looking out. And the speaker before me was this wonderful woman, an Australian woman, actually, called Heather, who had had a very tragic skiing accident and was paralyzed from the neck down. And what happened was a robotics company actually built her an exoskeleton, which was, you know, very progressive in 2011. And she literally got up on stage and walked for the first time. And everyone in the auditorium lost it. They were like, people are crying. It's emotional. There's so much feeling in the air. And I'm standing in the wings about to go on next going, oh, my God, I'm dying. I literally have to follow Lazarus. I mean, she, she's got up and you can see here one of the images from that talk. She walked across the stage for the first time since she was paralyzed. And it was an extraordinary moment for Heather, but it absolutely compounded the terror that I was feeling. How do you follow that? And it got worse. You know, literally Heather walks off the stage and she like walks past and goes, good luck, Simon. And I'm like, oh my God. And this gentleman walks up to me, all in black, with a headset and so on, and taps me on the shoulder and says, are you Simon? And I'm like, uh, yeah, duh. I'm like, I'm about to go out. What do you want? Don't bother me. You know, like, that's what I was feeling. And he said, well, listen, the, uh, the monitors out there, the confidence monitors that show you what slide's coming, the signal's been intermittent all day, and it's been causing a problem, so we turned it off. Good luck. And he walked away. And I'm like, you're kidding me. This is one of the first TEDx talks. There's 1,500 people out there. It's my first public speech. The book is coming out in a few days. And you've just given my safety net. Those slides have just disappeared. It was, it was, it was just not good. That's all I'm going to say. That's the polite way I can say it, as opposed to what went through my head at that time. And then all I heard was, Simon Murray, and I walk out. And if you actually get to watch it, my TEDx talk in San Francisco, You'll see, you'll see that I'm constantly looking over my shoulder because there was no monitors in front of me. I was like, where am I? I don't know. And I had to wing it. And that taught me one thing. You know, you just got to make the best of any situation. But also, you've got to be prepared. You've got to learn how to do this. It's a craft. It's a skill. You've got to be prepared for anything. And so I then spent the next several years really becoming a student of the art of speaking because I'd never done it before, never had to, never aspired to it. And so the insights I'm going to share you with you today are those that have proven most valuable to me. Now, there are lots of other insights that may resonate more deeply in other ways, but these were the ones that I use that have allowed me to enjoy the success as a speaker, but also I want to give them to you so that you can leverage them to make sure you resonate as deeply as possible in the room. So let's dive in. So I want to bucket the insights into three broad areas, you know, that really allow you to transform the power, the presence, and the impact you have as a speaker, because all of those are critical. Can you fill that room? Are you actually present where you are, or are you up in your head? 
And are you having the impact you intended, whether it's to raise funds, whether it's to win over a team, whether it's to kind of really inspire an audience? So let's start with Sir Ken Robinson. Now, tragically, Sir Ken passed recently. He was the most downloaded TED Talk for many, many years, if not still today. You know, he's someone who commands a fee in excess of $100,000. He was with Washington Speakers Bureau, um, you know, per speech, his fee. And he's somebody that has inspired literally not just millions of people around the world through his books and his speaking, but, you know, generations. And I've seen him speak, obviously, and he almost invariably gets a standing ovation through the way that he communicates. And so he and I were speaking um, on the same day at the Cannes Advertising Festival way back then in, in 2011. And I spoke to Sir Ken afterwards and I said, listen, I'm a student of speaking. I'd, I'd love to chat more with you about how you go about it. You're so extraordinary. And he said, well, let's go to dinner. And I went to dinner with he and his wife and we talked about speaking for an hour or two. And I want to share with you something that has made such a meaningful difference to me. And here's the insight. I asked him, how do you prepare? How do you kind of get ready to show up in a way that has such immediacy to it, that really captures the audience's attention, that has them sitting on the edge of their seat? And I thought he might say, you know, it's, it's really about rigor and, and, and discipline and all these sorts of things. But what he actually shared with me was the opposite. He said, you've got to know your material so well that the only preparation you do is that you remind yourself why you're speaking, why you're even making that effort, why you're even giving that talk, and then have in your back pocket three or four stories, arguably ones with some humor to them, because that always builds rapport with an audience, and then go up there and discover it with them in the moment. Discover it with them in the moment. And the reason that's so powerful, what he taught me in that moment, was that an audience is much more captivated if you are, they are discovering it in the moment with you, that immediacy that you bring to it. So obviously I've organized the slides for today's presentation, this webinar, but I haven't prepared for it at all in the sense of going through it or writing out a speech or anything like that. I'm discovering it in the moment with you. And that brings a whole level of urgency and energy and dynamism to it because I'm thinking on my feet and you're listening and discovering what I'm sharing in real time. And it electrifies the room. It wakes everybody up. And it stands in stark contrast to anyone else who comes out there. And you know what it's like when they start talking and you're like, oh, wow, they're just rolling out a speech that they've kind of crafted and curated within an inch of its life. But it feels like they're just trotting out the same message over and over again. So in terms of your preparation, know your material well enough to just trust that if you remind yourself why you're speaking, and have those stories that bring it to life in a very human way, that's enough. And if you feel like you can't speak with confidence extemporaneously like that, then you don't know your material well enough because you should be able to speak on your feet about it because you live and breathe this work that you're sharing with others. So remind yourself why you are speaking and then have those stories that you're gonna to bring to life with the same immediacy that you do the rest of your presentation. The second mentor that has made such a difference to me is Patsy Rodenberg. And she was the head of voice at Guildhall, a very prestigious acting school in, in London. And she trained, you know, the Royal Shakespeare Company for over 20 years. All the actors you know, from Ralph Fiennes to his brother Joe Fiennes here to Orlando Bloom to, you know, all the different names that we see in movies all the time. And she teaches workshops out here in LA. And I was lucky enough to study with her in her workshops for four years. And you do a wide variety of things, you know, body work, voice work, you know, different types of material. But what she really focuses on is presence. And she's written a lot of books about this, you know, Second Circle and others, where you really, you own your body, you're on your breath, you know, you feel like you are living in the moment. And so let's talk about that for a second. You know, I've had the opportunity to do over 200 keynotes, 250 keynotes around the world. And 
every time you're tired, you're jet lagged, you're busy with work, you're distracted, you know, you've got to kind of corral yourself. You've got to mobilize what it takes to do a good job. Because especially if you're opening or closing a conference, you set the tone for that conference. You immediately let people know, is this going to be of value or not? And let me tell you something. I've discovered that you win or lose an audience in the first five steps you take on stage. Because the degree to which you have that presence, some might call it charisma or otherwise, determines whether they feel like they want to listen to you, that you're confident, and by extension, that you know what you're talking about. And so this is a concert hall in, in Vienna. It's one of the largest concerts hall in Europe, concert halls in Europe. And I spoke there at the World Congress of Credit Unions um, a year or two ago. And, you know, jet lagged, feeling upside down, tired. And then you walk to the venue and you go, oh, my God, this is really, really large. There's another sort of tier that goes back behind. You can't even see in that photograph. It's a very, very large room. And so what do you do when you feel intimidated by the space itself? And there you see me speaking on that stage a little bit later in the day. And I want to share with you the insights from Patsy. And these are tricks and techniques that world-class actors and presenters and CEOs learn from her to make sure that you command the room appropriately. And so the first thing is touch the walls. What does that mean? You know, often you get up on stage only to discover in the moment, well, how do I reach the back of the room? How do I make sure I'm connecting with people? How big should my gestures be? Or how small and intimate do I need to be? And what Patsy taught everybody that did her courses was, you know, these actors, what they do is they walk around whatever stage they're on and touch the walls with their hand physically to make it real to them, to allow them in a sense to own the room because they're physically connected with its dimensions. So I walked around that concert hall, which is quite a walk. That was my uh, steps for the day. Walked all the way around the far reaches of that concert hall and back. And suddenly it stopped being this intimidating, you know, expansive space and became this finite room that I knew because I'd literally touched the limits of that room. And it makes all the difference. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, you're going in to do a pitch with 12 people in the room, or you're going to do a, a, you know, a town hall meeting for your company, or you're going to, you know, do a large speech or presentation at an industry forum. If you can get in the room in advance and just walk around and touch the walls. People won't even notice. Or if the AV guy in the corner sitting at the table sees you, he's like, that guy's clearly crazy. You know, but it doesn't matter because it makes a difference to you. And then secondly, what Patsy shared was, you know, everyone gets nervous. And you've heard many kind of established actors and others talk about how you've got to use those nerves. Don't try and suppress them, but channel them, put them into your work. But one of the most effective ways you can manage them that Patsy shared is realize that the story is bigger than you. So what she said to us in these classes is, you know, these young Royal Shakespeare Company actors, you know, the ones that hold the spear on stage all day while Ralph Fiennes is out doing Coriolanus, you know, they get nervous. And what she would say to them is, this isn't about you. The story is bigger than you. Commit to the story. And it's true whether you're talking about your company and your fundraising or whether you're pitching an idea about the impact you're going to have, or whether you're sharing your thinking with you know, the industry at large. Realize that you're just a tool in service of a higher order purpose or story. And get off yourself and onto that story. And suddenly, those nerves, that anxiety, yes, you can use that in your presentation, but also it can be directed towards that end instead of being bottled up inside you and you're thinking, what are people going to think of, of me? Am I smart? Am I good enough? Is it, uh, am I as good as the, the last speaker or the best speaker? Will I be invited back? All of those sorts of things. Put it in service of the real purpose of your talk, which is your higher order purpose or the story you're telling. And then this is arguably a somewhat inappropriate um, topic to take on, but it's a very, very powerful technique, so I can't shy away from it. When we're nervous, a lot of us go up into our chest. We sort of hold our breath up in our chest and we're not breathing from our diaphragm. And what that does is it changes your voice. It changes, you know, how your physicality. And these are the sort of things that accuse to people when you work on that walk on stage that you're nervous, which then sort of undermines your confidence and your expertise in a given area. So if you're standing there about to walk into a pitch room 
or you're about to sort of, you know, walk on stage at some presentation, one of the fastest and quickest ways to actually relax your body and get on your breath is to relax your sphincter. And we all know what that is and we all know where it is. But if you are at a standing desk right now, you can try doing that and you'll feel how, you know, if you're, you're holding your sphincter, your air is up in your chest and, and your body is taut. But if you relax it, not only do you drop into your body, but you feel the floor rise to meet your feet. And when you're in contact with the ground, that speaks to your confidence. That speaks to your self-assuredness. So, you know, these are more presentational techniques tools you can use in the moment, you know, prior to going out on stage, touch the walls. As you're waiting in the wings, remind yourself that the story is bigger than you. And then if you're feeling nervous, you're like, you know, you're about to be announced. You're about to go into that pitch, which you really need. You need that capital investment for the next round or fund, you know, that you're, you're building. Relax your sphincter and allow the floor to rise to meet your feet and just really be on your breath, breath and be present. So, if there was any way I'd sum up those techniques that Patsy shared amongst others, and these are all of her insights, not mine, get out of your head, get into your body, and get on your breath so you can speak with confidence and self-assuredness. Out of your head, into your body, and on your breath. And as I go through this, if this inspires questions, make sure you click on the dialog box, the Q&A box, and put your questions in there because we'll be taking questions fairly soon. And then the third mentor of sorts, I would say, per, a person I've learned a lot from is President Clinton. I was lucky enough to speak before him at a Gucci group event in Miami in my early days around 2012. And, you know, I spoke before him, which was intimidating enough, but I learned so much by how he spoke. You know, we'd all seen him at the DNC the Democratic National Convention give speeches, you know, through the Obama administration and really be, had powerful effects. We'd seen him in his own presidential speeches, but it wasn't up till I could watch him from the second row close up that I could really start to understand what he was doing. And he's all about intimacy. And let me explain what I mean. When he walked out, he looked around the room and then he connected with somebody and he talked to them intimately. And he shared the idea and what he was saying with that person one-on-one. -on -one. And at some point, that person felt, wow, this person is really directly, openly communicating with me. And it's the President of the United States. And I feel a little bit nervous, so I'm going to look away. Or I'm not quite sure how I feel. Or should I be intimidated? I don't know. And then when they look back, I saw him give them a look of like, I'm here. I'm speaking directly with you. It's okay and you matter. And you, the person relaxed and was like, oh, okay. And then he went on to somebody else and he spoke to someone in the back of the room and he was only talking directly to that person and everyone else vanished. The rest of the world disappeared. And if you hear anecdotes about meeting President Clinton and so on, people always say you feel like you're the only one in the room. And he did that one by one by one. And what he was doing was he was scaling intimacy gradually. He was building a depth of rapport one by one by one that I'd rarely seen in other speakers. And what I noticed after 20 minutes of kind of, you know, meat and potatoes, really building that intimacy in the room, the whole room just went whoosh, and was just profoundly connected to him. And he had them absolutely captivated. And one other thing I noticed as everyone was chatting afterwards when he finished was you know, he'd talk to someone and then as he'd walk away, he'd look back and then keep going, like really communicating to that person that the conversation meant something to them. And so I think he's a master of really making people feel like he is 100% committed to them in his communication. And he does it one by one by one. He scales intimacy in the room. And it's interesting because I was so naive at the beginning of We First and speaking that I was foolish enough to then go and write an article in Forbes called The Magic of President Clinton and How You Get It. And this was in 2012, November of 2012, like the week after I spoke at the, the Gucci Group event. And then oddly enough, you know, a few weeks later, I received a letter from the office of William Jefferson Clinton. And he actually wrote and said, I saw the article. Thank you so much. It was very insightful. And, you know, we, we exchanged a few letters about capitalism and business and that sort of thing. 
So, you know, I lay this out even in more detail in this article, um, and he sort of confirmed it in the conversations we had. So, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit verified, shall we say, but he scales intimacy one by one by one. And if I was to sort of boil all this down in terms of what I found has made all the difference that has allowed me to enjoy a higher degree of success than I might have otherwise had as a speaker, having had no prior training or aspiration to do it, it's access the immediacy in the way Sir Ken Robinson talked about. You know, know your material well enough to simply know why you're, you're sharing that material, have some stories at hand and discover it in the moment. And then apply presence, go around the room, touch the walls and make sure that, you know, you're on your breath, you're in your body. You've got that presence so that people know that you command the stage, you command the room, you're an expert in your, in your area. And then scale intimacy as you talk to people, go around the room and really connect with them personally instead of just having this broad brush kind of expansive look out there where you're just talking to everyone and no one all at once. And so hopefully they are meaningful and powerful insights that you can use. And obviously this webinar is being recorded and we post it on our YouTube channel so you can go back to it and, and pull out these insights. But I've found that this has been incredibly transformative in terms of how I show up as a speaker and the difference, most importantly, that makes for those in the room because it ensures that it's not about you, but it's about them. What's in it for them? How do they take this information? How does it land meaningfully for them? And then how can they apply it out in the world? I wanted to then expand into one other area, which is, you know, prior to starting we first i was a pitch doctor for a long time you know helping agencies or brands you know craft their pitches to make sure they win the day and all of us know how important that is today whatever your goals are and i just wanted to point out one fundamental shift one difference that makes all the difference and here it is this is oversimplified grossly oversimplified but i had to kind of make it generic to apply to all types of companies b2b b2c large and small venture firms private equity who knows most people when they approach a pitch go in and lead with what they want to sell and the structure of the deck typically goes like this you know who are we what we do what's the opportunity what our product is how it works what it costs what the upside or return could be and next steps but that's leading with what you want to sell rather than what the person on the other side of the table, the client, the prospect, the investor, what they need. So if instead you lead with their need, you become client focused. And so what you start with is who you are, our understanding of who you are as a company, as a brand, as an organization, as a nonprofit, as a potential investor, and what you need from the research you've done, what's working for that organization and what's not where the tension points are, what the challenges are, what you're trying to solve for. And then you lay out what's the opportunity for you if you solve for that. Still, not about you, about them. And then you position your product in service of that need. So you become a solution to an existing problem rather than another problem that they don't have time or resources or bandwidth for. And then you explain how it works and what it costs and what the return can be of using your product, service, business, partnership to solve for the existing need they have. And it sounds obvious when it's laid out this simply, but I would probably say not over 90% of pitches that I've seen always are self-directed because as you approach a pitch and you're putting it all together, you're always thinking about what you're doing, what you're offering, what its value is, and so on. And so you end up talking about yourself. And if you're on the other side of the table, you want to hear what's in it for you. So if you reverse engineer that and start with their need and your understanding of them and what they're trying to solve for and then position what you're offering in those terms, it is a night and day experience, not just for them directly, but as compared to other people that are pitching. Because just imagine, you've got eight agencies, it might be, that you're pitching against, or it might be that you've got, you know, four or five companies approaching the same investor. If you go in this way, they'll have an experience of people talking about themselves, and they'll have experience of you talking about them. 
And it is absolutely transformative in terms of the results that you get. And specific to this topic, if you have any questions about pitching or fundraising or, or how to present yourself to get the result you want, make sure you click on the Q&A, the dialog box, and enter those questions as well. And so, you know, on the strength of all of that information, which I hope is valuable, this is literally what I do when I go into a, to a speech. I make sure if I can, I go around the room and touch the, the, the room to make sure it becomes tangible to me and the dimensions of it become familiar. So I know how, how big to be, how small to be, how intimate, the muscularity of the room with the audience. And then I, when I'm standing there and I'm waiting in the wings, whatever the presentation is, I ask myself, well, why am I doing this? Like if I'm nervous, I'm tired, I'm anxious, I'm jet lagged, I'm nauseous, God knows what. I say, why am I doing this? What am I in service of right now? And for me, it's related to really repurposing business and capitalism to provide the solutions we need at scale more quickly. And then I remind myself, it's not about me. Like, get over yourself. It's the story is bigger than me. So really lean into the higher order purpose of what you're doing. And then I make sure that I relax my sphincter, that I, I get in my body, I get on my breath, I get out of my head, I feel the floor rise to meet my feet underneath me, and I make sure that I'm off myself and I'm on to them. And if you walk out, leaning into the audience, saying, hey, you know, I've got some valuable insights to give to you today, and I really want to make sure you work out of here equipped with things that can be transformative in your life and your business and your impact, as opposed to, I'm the speaker, everyone's looking at me, I hope I get through my material okay, I hope I'm good, and where am I, and what am I thinking about? It's a night and day result. And so, we're, before we go into questions, just a couple of things. Hopefully this is useful, and I want to give you a couple of other assets out there that, are, that can help carry your business and impact for, further. If you go to leadwithwe.com, you'll find information about the podcast we have, where we have top business leaders walking through how they are bringing their purpose and business to life. And then secondly, you'll also see a page about my new book coming out called Lead With We, which really shows you what I think is the future of leadership and how you need to drive business growth collaboratively in the future. Absolutely critical in this changing and challenging world we're in. So check out Lead With We. If you listen to the podcast, please do rate, review, and subscribe. It always helps more people see it. And, you know, some of the guests we've just recently had, the co-founder of Allbirds, which is, you know, this uh, footwear brand that's blowing up, soon to be an apparel brand as well. You know, the CEO of Mammut, which is one of, the, you know, 164-year-old company, Alpine Adventure Company in Switzerland. And Scott Scott Harrison, the CEO and founder of Charity Water, one of the most impactful and meaningful nonprofits in the country, if not the world. So really, really valuable. Check out leadwithwe.com. Love you to sign up to find out about the new book. And so let's dive into questions. And I, I really, really appreciate everybody's input on time. Um, so let's have a look here in terms of what people are saying. All right. Glenn, from Glenn, touch the wall. It's a great insight, but how do you do that on Zoom? That's a really, really good question. And I actually just have to say, I've heard two different schools of thought. I've seen speakers who've approached it by going bigger, almost as if they have to plunge through the lens of Zoom out to reach everybody. And I've heard other people say, you've got to really dial it in and be intimate. I take the approach where I think about the audience that I'm speaking to. I think about what is actually, you know, most pressing or urgent or needed in their lives. And then I really commit myself to delivering that wherever they are. And in terms of the context, the physical dimensions, I just always remind myself that you're in your living room, you're at your kitchen table, you've got tchotchkes on the, on the shelf, a kid's probably going to walk in, there might be a cat crossing frame, who knows? But in all cases, you know, it's an intimate setting, but you just want to show up as authentically as possible and deliver as much value as you can through the lens. So a great question, Glenn. Okay, the next one. Harry, I assume you would recommend taking a good class to help you develop skill sets for speaking, yes? You know, it's interesting. I didn't know it at the time. I did these things because I had that sort of shocking first experience where I just had to wing it. 
on my first speech and I thought, wow, I want to put some intention behind this. I've heard a lot of people do Toastmasters. I've heard a lot of people talk about the National Speakers Association and I've been to their conferences and spoken there. I think there's these different forums where you can train yourself in a way. Now, obviously, with COVID and Zoom living, it makes it a little bit harder. So I would look for what resources are out there like like this one and others and but the, the 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 most important thing is to start putting them to work even on your zoom calls start practicing things like even today before this zoom call you know there's a lot of other things going on we have client calls all day and that sort of thing and i make sure i get present and focused and on my breath and in my body before i talk to you you hear it in someone's voice you always know when someone's pushing or someone's trying to say something as opposed to being themselves, where they're on and in their breath, they're speaking from their diaphragm. So it doesn't matter where you are. Look, look at how those, what those classes can offer you, even during the Zoom period, and then practice what I'm sharing today and what they share with you in those Zoom calls and start to see what difference it can make. Because the difference starts in your body and then their perception in a live audience or their perception through a Zoom call that's really just the, the vehicle by which they experience that. But it starts with you, and then however it's projected, you know, it'll translate. It's a great question. Zoom does make things easier and also harder in some ways. Um, Thomas and Lisa, how do you build intimacy when you cannot see the audience and their reactions to what you are saying? You know, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Without repeating myself, it's how you show up. If you're willing to be vulnerable and authentic and open, that's an implicit permission slip for the other person to do the same. But at the same time, you've got these tools where you can modulate your voice. Like sometimes you've seen that I've been quite elevated and excited about what I'm talking. But when I was talking about, you know, President Clinton and he would look back and it meant something to you. Or when I was talking about walking on stage after you know Heather had miraculously walked, I used pauses and I used silence, hopefully as effectively as I was using, you know, more agitation in my voice. So a lot of speakers, you know, through the intimacy of, of Zoom, often can be very monotone. You know, I think we've all done enough Zoom calls now to go, wow, this is just droning on and people are kind of monotone and and there's not really you're not engaging us. It just feels like we're plodding through this. But without overdoing it, in whatever capacity you're doing a presentation on Zoom, use silence strategically. Use, you know, be passionate where you're authentically passionate. Don't be disingenuous about any of this stuff. Just show up authentically, but don't be shy of having color in your voice and having range in your movement and speaking quietly. Because, you know, what I've found on stage with large audiences of two or 3,000 people is after a while, it becomes quite muscular. You can actually lean into an audience and speak more and more softly because you're sharing something that's so important and you feel the audience literally lean in to hear what you're going to say. And then other times you can be expansive and really kind of jolt them up out of their seats. And again, it's not to be manipulative or disingenuous, but in terms of creating intimacy, just know that you're not limited by the lens. The tool at your disposal is your voice and your body and your ideas and use the full set of those skills, the full spectrum of those skills so that you do keep people engaged. So great question. Next question, Clint, how can those of us that lead within organizations best transition to leading on our own as speakers and entrepreneurs? Wow. You know, it's interesting. For a long time, you had the usual suspects being personal brands above and beyond their companies. So you had Indra Nui at PepsiCo. You know, you had Richard Branson, who's this sort of maverick entrepreneur. You had Howard Schultz of Starbucks, who was always speaking to cultural issues. But ever since the rise of issues like climate crisis, and especially since COVID put business on notice as to how they're going to show up. And then Black Lives Matter called out people to have a point of view around an area which they probably or they definitely have neglected for too long. Every CEO, every CMO, anyone in a leadership capacity, a solopreneur, a founder needs to be articulate. They need to be a personal brand on behalf of their company because everyone from their employees to their suppliers to customers to consumers want to know 
what is your role in the world? Are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? In which case, think of yourself as a personal brand and think of yourself going out to market and really having to be a spokesperson on an industry stage or on a larger stage about these issues. In which case, how do you want to show up? Like, and this doesn't mean that there's some archetype or some stereotypical branded CEO that you've got to model yourself on. Be yourself. You know, Scott Harrison shows up in a very sort of humble, authentic way as someone who is living the excess of a nightclub, you know, life in New York, who then had a wake up call as to the meaningful role he could play in terms of getting clean water to people all around the world. You know, there are those who are more provocative. You look at brands like Ben and Jerry's or Patagonia that take on issues like public lands and sue the president or take on white suprematism. And they are very strident in their opinion because we have no time to lose and these issues are simply unconscionable. So find where it lands for you within this spectrum of being, you know, um, confidently positive through to being, being intentionally provocative and then show up in that way. And do it for your teammates, do it for your clients, do it for you know the industry at large and the world at large. Whether you're a founder, a CEO, the head of a nonprofit, an invest, you know, uh, an entrepreneur looking for an investor. So, to answer your question, be intentional about it. Make sure there's an alignment between who you are and how you're showing up, and then walk that through with all stakeholders. And just start to know that you've got to play that role because that's the expectation now. So, thanks for that great question. And uh, how do you handle a heckler? Oh my God, that's so awesome. Um, I've had the odd heckler in the time. I won't even go into details, but I, I had somebody who on stage with a large audience, uh, uh, you know, a highly elevated audience, you know, I had different opportunities for Q&A or engagement or questions during the presentation, called out and said, I think you're full of it basically. I think you're absolutely full of it. I was talking about purposeful business and blah, 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 and so on. And they had a different view on life and the role of business and, and how they see things and around climate and everything else. And I have found that rather than being confrontational or defensive, the best thing to do is say, let's stop for a second. This is a really important question. I want to better understand what you're objecting to and why. And it's a little bit of a jujitsu move because you take the attention off you having to defend yourself and turn the tables and say, hey, I want to understand what you're objecting to. And I want to understand a little bit more about what gives you that perspective and how articulate you are about that. Because often there may be a lack of awareness or some misinformation that you can course correct and you ask them to consider, or they just simply are looking for a fight. And you know, if they are just looking for a fight, and there have been a couple of circumstances like that where, you know, people come up to me afterwards and said, oh, my God, that person is always like this. You know, it's got nothing to do with you. They're always just wanting to, I don't know, command the room, have some attention, be obstructionist for no reason. And what you say to them is you go, you know what? I think this is a really important discussion, but I don't think the tone of this discussion is appropriate for what's going on right now. So I want to make sure that you know it's really important. I want to elevate this discussion. So can you and I meet directly after this presentation? And let's sit down, and have a coffee, have lunch, and really deep dive into it. And so, you know, validate it. Don't dismiss it. Don't be defensive, but effectively take it offline. So another great, another great question. Everyone's like, what about all the things that go wrong, not the things that go right, which is awesome. Um, oh, often, this question, how can one find authentic authenticity rather than being performative also, do you recommend Toastmasters? Yeah, I've heard a lot of people have great success with Toastmasters. I think on all of our Facebook feeds, we see people reaching milestones on toast, post, Toastmasters. I see people from the NSA, the National Speakers Association, um, and I see you know lots of different courses and training out there about how to be better speakers. So yes, I do recommend them. And authenticity. You know, authenticity is a function of a lot of dimensions of your life. You know, I spent years traveling around the world as an ad guy working in Australia, then London, and then all over the US, living out different versions of success because I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I thought that's, that would give me the fulfillment that I need. But what I realized through the insights and education that effectively mentors gave me, the other people that I met on the way was, fulfillment is an inside job. You don't get fulfillment by the awards, the recognition, the stages you're on. You get fulfillment from 
how you fill yourself up by what you give to others. And so when that shift happens, it allows you to go, I'm going to be of service in everything I do. And if that takes the form of I'm the quirky, comical guy that some people really love and some people hate, or if I'm going to be the really serious, cerebral guy that you know some people respond to and others don't, or if I'm going to be the protagonist who's really going to push the issues and always call people out, that's okay too. But just find that alignment between who you are, what you do, and how you show up, and then damn the consequences. I mean, there's a lot of expressions out there like you might as well be you because you're the only one qualified to do it and everyone else is taken. And you will find your audience when you do that. You will find those who absolutely love you to death and are your greatest champions. And you'll find people who think you're absolutely full of it and, and not worth the time of day. And I experienced that all the time. And one of the things I experienced was when I put myself out there publicly for the first time with a book, I had no idea that people on the web really just like to troll and give you a hard time. And, um, you know, there was lots of experiences that before that I might have gone, I don't want to do this. This is no fun. I'm just getting pillared by all these people. They thought it was woo-woo, idealistic, Pollyanna crap that no one should be listened to, no one should listen to. And I had very, very active, aggressive feedback, a minority of it, but people who felt very strongly a different point of view. And even more so in recent times, you get trolls that really go after you and so on. And so... You know, it's the price of entry. We all live our lives publicly now. We're, we're living, we're being private in public. And, you know, it's a challenge, but it also is the nature of the game these days. So all I would say is that if you're willing to step up and go out there, know that it's part of the rules of the game and you shouldn't take it personally and nor should it dissuade you from being authentically aligned with who you are. I hope that helps. Um, last couple of questions. We've got a question here from Marshall. Marshall says, how do you find or be accepted for speaking engagements? You know what's really interesting about that? And actually, do keep the questions coming because we have five more minutes than I thought there. Um, there's that expression in life, work begets work. And really, every job you do is your next job. So I'm going to speak to, speak to two circumstances, when you don't have a speaking agent and when you do. You know, <laughs> when I started out as a speaker, I had no real, no speaking, nothing. <laughs> and true story, I, uh, I put some, did some photographs where I'm in a suit and I'm on stage looking like I'm speaking, but there was no one in the room. You know, you got to fake it till you make it. But at least I had a photograph of me speaking that I could attach to an email or I could reach out to somebody. Um, and then you've got to speak for free for a while. I think, you know, for the first... Uh, 12 to 18 months, I did many, many free speaking events because you have to build what they call a reel. You have to give some footage. You have to show some traction in the marketplace. And so, and you've got to learn your craft because you can understand it intellectually, but you've got to do it out there in the room. And so, you know, for that first 18 months, I was speaking a lot, but I wasn't necessarily getting paid and I was learning, you know, you're standing on the floor with people all around you. You're up on a stage looking down on people. You're in a room and the room is only half full because you're on some track of a conference and only half the people turn up. You have people walking out on you because you, they don't agree with you or they've got somewhere else to go and that freaks you out. You're upside down because of jet lag and you, all you want to do, I was in Milan speaking at a conference and... Um, I just felt really sick from the jet lag because I literally flew, flew in, went straight to the hotel, had a shower, got changed and went to the venue because they're just timings and flights and so on. And I was standing there in the wings and I'm on my own. There's no team. There's no supporters. There's nothing like that. You just get out there and get it done. And I literally in the five seconds before I took the stage and it was a big audience, I threw up in my mouth that kind of hot, burning, acidic throw up when you have no food in your stomach from jet lag, nausea. And I remember walking out on stage with this searing, burning throat, like, I hope to God I don't throw up and you've got to show up. So, you know, all those circumstances. So anyway, if you're not speaking, get out there, get some photos, ask people to let you speak. Even if it's a small group, you know, get something to show someone. If you do have a speaking agent, every job is your next job. And I've heard from a lot of event organizers that people kind of... Um, they, they treat you like a commodity, the event like a commodity. 
They fly in, they speak, they leave. I've taken a very different approach. I always make sure that when I go to an event, I say hi to everyone and I'm nice to everyone. I actually say hello and, and recognize that these are people who are busting their nut to pull off this seamless experience that takes so much work behind the scenes. We, we first, we did our own conference for four years. We know how much that goes into that. And also, I always stay for the, after the event to answer any questions. You're not like one and done and out of there. And I'll stay for an hour, two hours talking to people. If they invite you to a, a pre-event like cocktails or a thing like that, show up. And yeah, you may have one drink, but walk around the room and talk to people and introduce yourself and ask if there's anything you can do and answer and troubleshoot. All of that gets back to the organizer. And when you do that, they will think highly of you and they will not only want to bring you back again, but they will recommend you to other event planners because they all talk to each other. So it's all just basic stuff in terms of how you treat people and how you get recommendations from people in business, but it's especially true of speaking. And during the third thing I'll say is that during COVID, you know, everyone has had their fees cut and everyone has had to sort of show up and just to support the organizations that are struggling to stay alive because a lot of these live event companies I just have been reeling because their, their lifeblood has gone away and now they've had to pivot very quickly to digital events. So I've actually tried to show up and speak and support as much as possible just to help those organizations get through this because it will come back. It will take time, but let's show up and support when it's meaningful because that always comes back. It always comes back to you. So I thought that was a really great question. I hope that helps. Um, and just in terms of getting a speaking agent, one more note. Right now, the speaking agent business has taken a huge hit for all the obvious reasons. It has recovered to some point, but they're way off. So it's a difficult time to get a speaking agent, but it's a wonderful time to try and see if you can at least start to hone your craft in the Zoom version of speaking so that when you can get back up on stage and start collecting those content assets for a reel or something like that, you'll have already got that work out of the way. And um, Matthew, how should... PowerPoints and other visual aids be incorporated? How can we support, emphasize, and enhance what's being spoken? Wow, that's a really good question. It was interesting. I was invited to speak and do training for CEOs on Necker Island by Sir Richard Branson a few years ago. And one of the things I discovered there was he doesn't allow any PowerPoints at all in any presentations. He's like, if you can't say it simply and you can't explain it simply to, in a way that everyone understands on your feet, you haven't thought it through well enough. So that's one extreme. But one thing I did discover early in my career as a speaker, I would overload the slides with information, A, because I had so much to say and I was enthusiastic, and B, because you know I took comfort from that information. It almost shored up my credibility. Look, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a lot of spaghetti on the plate. It's a big meal. I'm, you know, I must be a good chef, bad metaphor. No, it, it was, and hopefully you see from this presentation, there's been large type, it's very visual, a finite number of slides, and some three key points coming back to those key points with a clear communication as to the value proposition. And so now, you know, I've really sort of learned the hard way and through watching other people's presentations that they the audience understands your communication, 70% of it through your physicality. That's one thing is a really powerful learning. They also are much more um, ready to accept information. If it's brought to life visually, it's more evocative. It brings dimension to it than a PowerPoint slide full of words. And so if I had to characterize the journey over the last nine or 10 years, it's just been an increase in font size, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now we're up to 38 point font size, you know? Um, and it's interesting. I've seen people from the design, architecture, innovation world Go up with presentations that are big, massive visuals with maybe one or two words on each slide. And across the entire presentation, there might be 19 or 20 words. But those words are springboards for them to communicate. But it's a balancing act between the big visual dimension and the key idea and then how they bring it to life through what they say. But in terms of how the audience you know, absorbs it and how how well um, set up they are to enjoy the presentation, it's much more effective. So that's, that's a great question. Um, and one of the tricks that people have said 
if people can't read your presentation from the back of the room, you've got to simplify it and increase the font size. Hopefully that helps. And then, Kevin, how do you gain people's trust when you are playing in an industry that is seen as even more as a necessary evil or difficult subject areas? That's interesting. You know, there are some areas, I mean, because issues are so polarized out, outright, as we see with the election, the recent election, and you see across social media, it's almost unavoidable to have people in the room that don't agree with you. So this is not about that you're in some really just obviously bad category. You work in the tobacco industry, but rather that everyone has different points of view these days. And I recently was, um, a couple of years ago, I spoke at the W. PSA, or the no, Western States Petroleum Association, so WSPA. And there was someone from the EPA, there was me, and then there was people representing oil and gas companies. And to their credit, they wanted a dynamic debate around sustainability, carbon emissions, what we're doing, is it enough, and if so, how and why, we, you know, what we need to do. And it was very, very controversial. And Kind of like I was saying before, if you have a, he a heckler, you've got to kind of take the sting out of it. You've got to kind of lance the wound in a sense by really speaking to how polarizing and, and controversial it is. And so what you really need to do is set up upfront that the people who have a very different opinion to you are recognized and heard. You see this, you know, right now in the presidential election where you see President elect Biden and others really speaking to those parties that were on the other side of the political spectrum saying we understand the pain and difficulty of loss. If you go out there and say, this is a polarizing issue, there are two sides. On the other side, people are deeply committed to these ideas. And, you know, there's good reason for them to have those ideas and so on and so on. It takes the sting out of the issue and it allows people to open their ears and maybe evolve the conversation as opposed to just kind of leading with what you want to say and your point of view and people shutting down as a result and digging their heels in. So hopefully that helps. And, you know, it's increasingly part of everything we do because in the near term, for sure, issues that are going to be polarized because those who are really invested in the way things have been done are really digging their heels in as opposed to those who are, you know, trying to evolve the way things need to be done to solve for our future. So we're in this real inflection point, you know, culturally at a societal level, at a global level. And last question from Nicola. How is speaking connected to your personal purpose or and company purpose? You know, it's a really good question because I always struggle between the tension between my personal brand and, and the company brand, We First brand. And in the first couple of years when I launched We First, I did the book and then I had to become a speaker and then a trainer and we did a conference and none of that was planned. There was no strategy. There was no roadmap. It was all just winging it. And so if anyone thinks that this is all strategic and looks good, not true. And so um, I initially found that I went from being an ad guy to being an author, speaker, trainer. And I had to kind of live up to that new expectation of me that took on a life of its own. But after a couple of years of it, it was nice to have, to have the privilege of people listening to what I said, but I also didn't want it to be about me. And so I stepped back and really kind of dialed down what I was doing and really leaned into we first. And it's not to say that it's an either or proposition. You need to do both. You need to throttle on both. And so with my new book coming out, you know, and do check out Lead With We um, to find out about it, you, I, I have to dial that back up again. And you probably noticed that We First has been putting out a lot more content and I've been putting stuff out there to that end. And really the best way to think about it is, you know, you're one tool in your purposes toolbox. And in a sense, I'm a tip of the spear and that I go out there and do the thought leadership work. So, you know, if the company's purpose is literally to repurpose business to solve for these issues at scale more quickly and so on, then I see my personal purpose, my role to get that out there, to be the evangelist. So we all have to wear many hats these days, but 95% of my time is founder and CEO of WeFirst and really overseeing all the work that we're doing in our consulting because we didn't, I didn't want to be an author, speaker, trainer, thought leader. I wanted to solve for this issue. And so I wrote the book, but then I stepped back so we can do the work inside companies, which is much less sexy and, and a lot harder in some ways 
But I've been doing that for the last seven years because this is real. We're trying to solve for it for real. It's not just a a shtick or a, a, a business, a gig, but rather it, 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 these are real issues that we've got to solve for. And so all of that is to say that your personal purpose, the role that you can play informs your company purpose, and you need to throttle on both cylinders. As I said, because CEOs and CMOs, everybody needs to be very articulate out there, either in the real world or across social and digital channels to bring it to life. So they all work together. Think of it telescopically from your personal purpose through your company purpose and out into the world, what you can achieve in your industry as a whole and as, as in business as a whole. So I, I got to say, I really, really appreciate all the questions today. If there's a question you have that I haven't solved for, or you want to know about speaking and so on, um, or you know, you, you'd like me to talk about an issue and, and speak, Re reach out to me on Simon at wefirstbranding.com, but do listen to lead, go to leadwithwe.com and check out the podcast. Those guys, those CEOs and those girls, those guys, those leaders are the ones who are doing day after day, repurposing their company to drive growth and impact. And I learn from it every single week. And I really appreciate the questions. Do know that, you know, fulfillment is an inside job. And by applying some of the insights that I've learned from Sir Ken Robinson and Patsy and President Clinton and the insights you can get from others. You can on Zoom and in the real world show up in much more meaningful ways that will allow you to get the results you need for your business so you can scale your impact and then together we can really chart out a, a brighter future. So thanks for everyone's time today. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Stay safe. The less we see each other, uh, the less we see others, the more we care about them. That's how I'm thinking about it. So have a good rest of your week and, and, and thanks for listening today.